Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. I want to be a developer. Everybody wants to develop. They want to build property. They want to build houses. They want to build assisted living. They want to build all these unique types of property. So today I've brought together this group of very young, with the exception of Mr. Pollock, very young real estate developers who are going to talk about development taking place in the region. My guests today include Adam Altman, who is the managing partner at, at KABR, Scott Berman, who is a principal at the Engel Berman Group and Bristol Assisted Living. Iran Pollock, who is the co-founder and CEO of HAP Investments. And last but not least, Stephen Dubb of the Beachwood Organization. So, why do you want to be a developer and where are you developing today? We're, we're developing uh, in the New York metro area and in Northeast Florida, Jacksonville specifically. Let's, let's try to reach it over here. You're developing rental and? We're developing just, right now we're just developing rental, uh, predominantly in Jersey City, also in Astoria. Uh, we like rental because after uh, 2007, the for sale market in Jersey City and uh, other places never really came back with the same force it came back with in New York. And with a rental property, you can own it long term. The financing from banks is terrific and uh, you can get a tremendous yield after now, you I, complete it. I have three other people here who spend more of their time in ownership in for, for sale units. Let's talk about what you're doing. Yep. So uh, on the development side of things, uh, we kind of have a, a two-pronged um, approach. We own and operate a high-end chain of assisted living facilities called the Bristol. We've That's got, for where Iran needs to go soon. Soon. He's the oldest <laughs> of the group. He's coming. So we have 15 operating and about a dozen in our pipeline. And then we have a combination of for sale and for rent residential product. Um, we've got about 2,000 units in that pipeline. Mr. Pollock, since I've been picking on you. Thank you to bring me to something that I am the oldest. It's about time <laughs> to get there. So thank you. But what are you doing today? You're, you, you've spent most of your time for for sale units. No, or? we're doing mostly for rent. Uh, we're doing a project in Jersey City, in Jonah Square, that will be for rent. 
And we have you a have to get his approval because he's very active in the Journal Square area. Uh, it's, uh, in my book, no problem. Yes. And, and we have a lot, I have a lot of projects in uh, northern Manhattan, in East Harlem, in Washington Heights, uh, all of them for rent. Uh, one project in northern Manhattan is Condo, and then I have a project in uh, Chelsea in 28th Street. One building will be Condo, and one building will be rent. And again, it's the same thing. We, I like the idea that you can own it. I, I like the idea that you are not so much attached to the market at a certain time when you finish the project or getting to finish the project. And in rental, you can rent. At one time, maybe for the older generation, one of the big items is that people wanted to own their own home. Okay, that was the American dream, uh, you know, for baby boomers in a circumstance. And that's what I'm seeing from Scott and from Stephen, okay, the American dream. So you're, you're building a lot of homes, mm -hmm. mostly for sale. Mostly for sale. We're building two rental projects right now that total about 350 rental units. But um, most of what we do is for sale. We're, we build everywhere from the Rockaways across Long Island to Southampton. And we do all types of product and pricing. So anywhere from the low 400s to uh, over $3 million. So who was the purchaser for your developments from the low 400s to the 800? I mean, what is the profile of a purchaser in a, in a Beechwood or in an Angle Berman residential? In the 4s and 5s, it's first-time home buyers or, or buyers who uh, have aged out of their homes, have been in homes for 20, 30, 40 years and want to scale down. Um, so they're leaving their homes and moving into condominium communities. So, but at that price level, we get a lot of first-time home buyers. Generally, they're moving out of the city or they're moving out of rental apartments in Long Island to their first home. Now, you were saying <coughs> before, similar yeah. Yeah, discussion. So similar. So we're, we're building communities anywhere from 100 to, say, 400 units per um, community. Um, it's sort of a lifestyle community, so we're building a nice big clubhouse and giving people um, sort of a, a place to congregate and uh, build them a, a real community. Um, and what we do is we come into markets and we like to undercut the single family home market by about 15, 20% and find that people, because of that, are willing to make a lateral move. Now, th there is this discussion of the 40, in, in Meadowbrook, which is 48, but in the other developments, and then we're going to get to something over there, of the over 55. Let's discuss that, why you build over 55, what's the benefit to the consumer, and what's the benefits to the developer? So, uh, honestly, the, r the real um, issue is, um, is, is the approval process in suburbia is, is very difficult. Getting through the various municipalities, getting through the health department, uh, all the various agencies you have to get through in order to get a project in the ground uh, can be extremely difficult. Typically, when you're age-restricted, it alleviates some of the concerns from the community, burden on the schools, schools et cetera, um, and that uh, can help you to fast-track a project. So our preference usually is to go market if we can, but usually it's not the case. Uh, everything Scott said is 100% correct, but there's also there's a market for it because Long Island's um, Nassau and Suffolk, they're two aging markets. A lot of the wealth is concentrated in the 55 and older. Uh, demographic and those are people who like I said have been in homes for decades and are aging out of their homes and want to move into a maintenance free product um, so when we get new projects approved and they're 55 and over um, there's a lot of demand for it because people want to move out of their houses and uh, change lifestyles what's the profile of the the people who are renting and the people who are buying in your developments I think it's very mixed um, I'm seeing uh, small families with one kids Renting uh, in northern Manhattan, uh, I'm seeing people that were growing in the neighborhoods and stay renting in northern Manhattan. I see, I see young students from all of the universities. So it's a very mixed uh, population. Let's talk about what you're doing in Astoria. Sure. And then Brooklyn and the other section. Sure, sure. Uh, Astoria is a rental, it's a rental product with retail on the bottom, so classic mixed use. By train station, so commuter friendly for pe people who have been priced out of Manhattan. And I think these communities are developing in such a way where people want to be there. They don't feel forced to be there. So the restaurants, the gyms, the uh, pubs, um, all of those things, people are choosing the different uh, communities they want to be a part of. 
And it's not that it's just about the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side anymore. Those are phenomenal and tremendous neighborhoods. But different people, there's a strong uh, Greek community. They have amazing Greek food in Astoria. And people tap into those different, uh, almost like microclimates and, and, and f find a level of appreciation and create a, a home for themselves in, in the way that our parents did. So what's the pricing for an apartment as a comparison for somebody to rent the apartment in Astoria? Compared to Manhattan, it's probably around uh, 25 to 30% less. Now, you know, there is, there is no question today that in Manhattan, okay, in certain parts of Manhattan and in certain parts of Brooklyn also, that it's become more of a tenant's market. Do you see that also? I haven't seen it in Jersey City. Um, and I think that's because there was such a wide and still is such a wide spread between the Manhattan rents and the Jersey City rents that as Jersey City becomes more of a place, it's becoming more of a place, as silly as that sounds. So the more people come over there and they see what Jersey City has to offer, they see the amenities of the buildings. Um, I often say people, people don't uh, necessarily want to live in a fifth story, walk up with an undersized kitchen and pay the same rents that they could in, in Brooklyn and pay the same rents they could pay for a high rise, gorgeous building full of amenities in Jersey City and commute to the to Manhattan in the same amount of time. I'm, I'm going to give you, you know, looking at this, I'm going to go on Stephen's situation over there. You, you, you're you developing the Rockaways. Let's talk about what you're building over there, which is another, you know, it's the same order as the Hamptons. It's beautiful over there. But part of the, 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 the negative, and it's not a negative because I believe <clears throat> it's going to be resolved a little easier, was the transportation. Mm -hmm. Ferries are going to help. Ferries help Jersey City. Ferries help everything. Ferries are definitely going to help. We, we've delivered 1,500 homes there for sale homes, so we're building 126 rentals now and retail at the base uh, of the building. I think um, what we've done there is we took 120 acres of land that was a wasteland. Um, it had been condemned by the city 50 years before and nothing had happened there. There were packs of wild dogs and drug dens and, and we built middle class housing there. So we've built 1,500 units, we've built 75,000 square feet of retail space, we built a YMCA. We brought in the first grocery store to open in the Rockaways in three decades. Um, we've created, it's at the, all at the base of the Beach 67th Street subway stop, so we've created a little bit of a self-contained city within a city. But the Beach 67th Street subway stop is still a long commute into Manhattan. It's an hour 15 from Midtown by train. So it is, it, transportation's a problem, but, um, or I should say a challenge, but, uh, I think as as the trend for as the trend um, has gone away from working in central business districts and and people are able to work from home, um, and we've provided a nice product that just wasn't available before in the Rockaways, uh, people have come down there. And if you go to Rockaway in the summer, not just Arvern where we're building, but if you go to other parts of Rockaway, there's a renaissance going on there. If mm -hmm. if you live in Brooklyn and you're in your 20s or 30s. Uh, and you can't afford to head out to the Hamptons or head out to Long Island, you're going to hang out in Rockaway. Um, and every year, that sort of critical mass just keeps building, and, um, and I think it's going to become a very special place. You know, there is an aging baby boomer population, which is the assisted living. I mean, the Bristol is, what, about 15 years old now? So the company was founded about, uh, about 15 years ago. And we've got 15 operating properties right now. People, when they hear assisted living, they have a misnomer of what assisted living is. It's basically a rental building, and we provide assistance with what we call activities of daily living. So bathing, dressing, toileting, medication management. So people who need a little bit of extra assistance from day to day um, with certain things. But you're really a hotel. Essentially, in many, in many aspects. Stay hotel you're for, an extended for stay. You're, yeah. you're, yep. you're month to month. Yep. Uh, are they long-term leases or are they month to month? They're yearly leases, which you can get out of at any time. Uh, if, God forbid you have to move on. Um, so that's how we restructure it. So where are the opportunities today for developers? And, and I'm, I'm putting this in a twofold question. Prior to the show in the green room, I was asking about banks, okay, because the banks have new regulations that they have to meet over there. Also, the banks are a little worried about what's happening. You know, new presidency, new pres new mayor, <laughs> new, you know, county executives and other situation over there. How, how are you seeing banks providing financing today towards all of your properties? We, we are still having a, 
a, a, a relatively easy time getting uh, loans on our properties. I think banks are looking for uh, developers and sponsors who they have a pre-existing relationship with, who they've had success with, um, who has a strong balance sheet, and who can come through. We had one bank tell us the other day they have 10 construction loans out there, and we're the, we are the only lo loan that has come in on time and in budget. And to us, that was, in one sense, a tremendous compliment, but in the other sense, it makes you wonder about some of the people who are acting as developers out there. I, I will say, when I look at this panel, you asked a question about competition, and one of the nice things about this group when we're talking in the green room is none of us directly compete. Everyone found a niche within the development world to, to find success and create their own Right, it's not killing each other, but that's why the four of you were selected to be here together. Right. I think the, the, the biggest challenge for a young developer is the fact that banks really are risk adverse today as opposed to 2006, 2007, and also the amount of leverage that they were giving. You know, it's uh, it, on the for sale side, it's just gotten tougher and tougher every year. It's a little easier on rental product, but nobody wants, nobody has an appetite for risk, and nobody wants to deal with the regulators. It's, it, I hate to say, it's not worth the risk reward of, of doing a construction loan on a development where it's an unproven person without deep pockets uh, over there in the situation. Yeah, I, I, we're told constantly that we're getting, we're even being considered for loans because of our track record and who we are. So I can't imagine what it would be like to not have a track record and not have a balance sheet. But you used to be able to go out to banks and get different terms on the same deal, depending on how they viewed the risk. And everything's become so much more commoditized because they're getting chiseled down by regulators who are told from Washington or wherever, this is what a construction loan should look like, and this is the amount of leverage. I, I think one of the biggest problems that happened was the change in the acceptance and the value of the land. Okay, if you bought the land a number of years ago at a lower basis and you're trying to get credit for it at a higher basis, the bank has to take it back at the original basis because of the situation over there. <clears throat> Basel III and HVCRE have yes. been a nightmare for us. How that, about was, you? that was for us the biggest advantage because we came 2010 and 11, bought very, very cheap. 11, 12, started to build, 2013, 2014, 2014, and we couldn't get that uh, imputed uh, equity on the land. Um, but I think uh, it's about creativity, especially if you're new. I'm new here uh, in New York, and I don't have a track record of uh, many, many years. So it's about creativity. There is uh, a lot of money all over the world that uh, looking to invest here in New York. Uh, if it's from Europe or Israel or Japan or China, EB-5, there is a lot of um, ways to finance a project. And uh, you need so, to so find let's, your way. Let's talk about alternative financing. Let's uh, explain to my audience, what is EB-5 financing? You've, you've used EB-5, you've evaluated, you're thinking about it, and it really doesn't work too well for, for for sale. Uh, I'm, I'm far from an EB-5 expert, but it's basically a program by which uh, you are going to create uh, some, a foreign investor is going to invest in your project. Their investment is going to, uh, in an area deemed uh, within a certain area of need, and it's going to create a certain number of jobs. And uh, basically in return for the creation of those jobs and the economic impact it will have on that area, they are um, entered into a visa process. Right, and the visa process basically is, it's a, I think it's a half a million today, but it's going to possibly be a million dollars. For that million dollars, that investor has the right to come to America when the project is completed that you're working mm -hmm. on and uh, under circumstances over there. Correct. Now, what it's doing is allowing a developer who's only received the certain, certain portion as the underlying layer mm -hmm. to increase the amount of leverage over there. Well, I, I mean, some of the jobs that are being built with EB-5 dollars, uh, they employ a tremendous, they're, they're union built, they create literally thousands of jobs. These projects would not have gotten built or considered otherwise, and it's creating uh, an, a huge economic impact, and it has the multiplier effect in those areas where these jobs are taking place. Now, have you, have you evaluated it for, you, you've done something unique, I think, yeah, in your assisted living. Yeah, the first seven assisted living projects we did, uh, we financed them with tax-exempt bonds. 
So we went to the local industrial development agency, and based on job creation, we got an inducement to float these tax exempt Similar to the EB-5. And the Very similar. And at the time, it was high leverage, um, and it was a, a reasonable rate, um, and, it, and it worked really well for us. And but today? With where rates are, um, we've been using conventional financing. Even so, for the assisted living? Yeah. And who, uh, so you're getting construction financing for the initial project, and then when it's stabilized, you, you're going... It's a program. So it's uh, acquisition and construction financing, and it, it stays as, as a permanent. For, what, 25 years? No, it's, uh, typically we take the deals out with agency financing after five or six years. Okay, so it goes to the agency. Now, you, you've, you've taken alternative financing. Yes. Which many people have said, I had a person uh, a couple of months ago from the Carlisle Group Mm -hmm. who was on the opposite side of the transaction, who doesn't, use, doesn't provide alternative financing, but they were very happy to use alternative financing. Why are you happy to use alternative financing as opposed to bank financing? Again, uh, uh, I'm new here, and uh, I don't have that track record that uh, a bank want to see. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is it's faster sometimes, and it's a more efficient process and you can start faster, finish faster, and there is an advantage to that also. And even though, you know, and people fail to look at it, it may be expensive, but it's less expensive of, than putting an investor as your partner in the yes. transaction. Mm -hmm. Where have you been getting your type of financing? Traditional we, from banks? Yeah, we, we've been able to figure it out. It gets constantly gets harder. Um, we used to be able to figure out home building deals and, and lever them to about 90% of total costs um, because you were able to structure them in ways that they were less risky for the banks. Um, we still structure the deals in the same way, but the leverage has gone down to the high 70s or low 80s. Um, and we're a company that functions entirely with our own money. We don't have partners. We don't have investors. Um, and so the difference of that lower leverage and being told you've got to put it up up front so as not to violate HVCRE makes things tougher. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, the, the top. The, one of the buzzwords today, be it New York City, be it Long Island, be it New Jersey, is the term transit-oriented communities. How many of your developments today are transit-oriented, would you say? So um, we've done a couple that are transit-oriented and we're working on a couple that are transit-oriented. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge benefit to the communities and the towns. Uh, it's the new buzzwords. So they're offering increased density and certain benefits if you can find these types of developments. Um, similar to downtown development, the downtowns up by where we live are, are dying. So there's a lot of incentives being offered. Right, but there. in downtown right now, especially where you're developing, Hempstead is allegedly going to have new developments for transit-oriented developments, plus the community development. Garvey's Point is another one over there. Huntington, there's been a number of developments in that mm -hmm. scenario. Um, our, our East Rockaway project, which is in the town of Hempstead uh, in Nassau County, is a block away from the train station. So we sell houses there from the high fours to the mid sixes, condominiums. Uh, but a lot of our buyers are people who commute into the city. Who are the people renting in Jersey City today in your developments? What, what's the profile of, of I, I, I would say 60 or 70 percent of our renters are coming from New Jersey. Um, so one of the misnomers is that everyone is coming from New York. Uh, there are a lot of people who are moving in, who are, uh, who are moving out of their you know, larger homes and want to have a, uh, a downtown lifestyle. Uh, it, you know, so we, we see a, a, you have a very large, um, you know, a, a bunch of very large ethnic communities within Jersey City who have strong roots and who are, are growing and following kind of that American dream. You have a, and what about your developments that you're planning in the Westchester communities today? We, we don't have any developments. We have existing properties in Westchester, but we don't have any planned developments. And who are the Westchester? tenants and... Westchester. In our Westchester properties, we have a mix of medical and lawyers, and uh, we have some government agencies, um, kind of standard fare. So now I, I, I'll bring out a question which created a little controversy when I brought this out a couple of months ago at a seminar. What's your thoughts about the concept of the co-living approach for residential development and so on? So um, I, I think there. Everything evolves, 
Um, we've seen how transportation has evolved with Uber, how eyeglasses have evolved with uh, Warby, Warby Parker. Parker right? Right? And I think, I think the way people live and interact with each other um, is also evolving and people need less space, they need more amenities. So there's absolutely a place for uh, a co-living. I think it's going to be- But, but can we have co-living? You see, I, my, my concept is that when people left college and would move into an apartment in a five-story walk-up, they had co-living. It, it wasn't called WeWork or Cohabitat. Right. Okay, it was co-living. Okay, they take a bedroom and they pay a specific rent. My my question today is: Do the new co-living approach? Because co-living has been around for fifty years. Okay, right. call it what it is. So now it's just curated, right? So so you're paying for that curation. Correct. Right. Well, for the same money, you get you get a nicer bed and a nicer uh, you know set of so furniture. Wait, but, but here's my point. I have four people here who are young, who are creative. How about the thoughts of going into a co-living concept? We're working on a project in Uniondale on the former A. Holly Patterson campus, which is owned by NASA University Medical Center. And we're going to do 500 rental units. And one of the concepts is to create a central living area with bedrooms around it. So for people who are in graduate school, just graduated college gives them an opportunity to rent a unit, a shared unit, uh, until they can afford to have a place for themselves. So you, you're, you're embracing, as one would say, the co-living. Now, I could see perhaps co-living in a portion of your room of apartments in the Rockaways because, as you're saying, it's a lower-cost alternative. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have the subway at 67th Street, mm -hmm. but I think... As I alluded before, ferries are very important, and they're planning right. the new ferry. We uh, There's a company called Common out there that also does co-living in, in the boroughs, and we've talked to them about taking a floor of uh, of the building to run a co-living, you know, almost as like a master lease. And what about you? Have you thought of it? I'm not into it yet. No. So in general, I, I'd say even though you know there are political events around the world and different changes, the residential development in the region continues to be positive. Mm -hmm. There's no question that the banks have put back a little bit, but if you're a successful or proven history, they're going to be there. And if not, as Iran said, you know, the alternative lenders are providing a very important place as well as the EB-5, and business is going to continue. So if I had my crystal ball, my crystal apple, I would say that 2017 looks good, and maybe in a couple of months you'll come back and give me your opinion later on. Sure. I'd, I'd like to, to thank Adam, Scott, Iran, and Stephen, and I'll see you next week.